let's begin reading in uh, chapter 21, verse 8 says, David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, Is there not here under thine hand a spear or a sword? For I have neither brought my sword, more my weapons, with me, because the king's business is required haste. He's lying. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it, for there is none other save it that is here. And David said, There is none like that, give it to me. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did not they sing to one another in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens, thou, tens of thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart. He was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them. He feigned himself mad in their hands. He scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down upon his beard. And then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need, have need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come home to my house? And David therefore departed. Evidently they threw him out of Gath. He departed from there and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they came down there to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. We come to a series, chapter 22, on the next four or five chapters are some of the most remarkable chapters in the life of David. Usually not familiar to us, but if you're interested in leadership at all, if you're interested in standing up and being the kind of Christian that will affect the body of Christ to any degree, if you're, if you're concerned about being a benefit, about doing things with your life that will bring about eternal consequences, those things that will remain when everything else is shaken, falls apart, then take heed to the lessons in these chapters as we move ahead now. Read through these chapters on your own. There's some remarkable lessons here. As we look at David today, God has brought him to this cave of Adullam. And take note of the process. He's bottomed out at this point in time. And again, you and I read through this. We're sitting here. We're comfortable. You have to realize David had never read these chapters. These are real issues for him. Samuel had come to him when he was a boy, you remember, anointed him, told him he was the next king of Israel. Great victory over Goliath. A job in the palace next to the king. Probably thinking all of these things were in keeping with God's calling. And yet now as we watch David through a process of years, the first thing that goes is his position. He's out of the palace and Saul is trying to kill him. And people here sometimes just fall apart when they lose their job. David's in that position. Not only that, he goes home. He loses his family. He can't go to them. And his wife betrays him. When we have folks here in counseling, his home is falling apart. If there's been adultery, they're in a process of divorce, their lives are in a shamble. We read through these things. Imagine, this is another weight that's placed upon David now. His own wife has betrayed him. He's lost his home, his family, his marriage. He fled to Samuel. And he couldn't stay there with Samuel because the army was pursuing him. And he leaves off his mentor, his counselor behind comes to Jonathan, his best friend, and can no longer stay with him. And is left friendless as he flees now. And he comes to Nob, to where the tabernacle was. Ahimelech, the priest, is there. And he lies to Ahimelech. He says, the reason I don't have a sword is because King Saul sent me out on business. It was hasty. I didn't have time to pack, to get my armor, to get my sword. And lies to Ahimelech. And Ahimelech and his family are going to be killed by Saul thinking that he's involved with David. And somehow Ahimelech says, well, I have here Goliath's sword, whom you slew. David says, I'll take that one. There's none like that. Imagine David with this big sword dragging on the ground now behind him. 
So you see, somehow, under the pressure, and you know what? Understandably, David's lost track of his sling. Because when he had a relationship with the living God, that sling was a giant killer. And through his life disintegrating, through pressures that we read about, but maybe some of you, they're heartfelt for you today because you're going through a portion of these things. Imagine, David, all of them are piled up at once. He's now lied to the priest. He's running in fear. He's lying. He's lost track of the living God. And he makes a major blunder. He flees to the Philistine country. He runs to Gath, Goliath's hometown. Imagine this. David's trying to escape. He runs into the gates of Gath with Goliath's sword dragging on his side. And the people in Gath said, wait a minute. Aren't you the guy that helped produce that hit song, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands? Aren't you that guy? And you know, sometimes I think people get so discouraged and, and filled with such despair and, and they're so confused and disoriented about what the Lord's doing in their life. They go back to the unsaved world. They go back to the bar. They go back to the enemies of, of God's people, as it were. They go back to the unsaved territory. They go back to the old haunt. And when you have the unbelievers challenging you, aren't you the champion of Israel? Aren't you David, the giant killer? Nope, 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 nope. You know, he, I mean, when the unbelievers start to reprove you because your lack of faith, you've hit rock bottom. Weren't you one of those Bible thumpers? Didn't you tell us Jesus was sufficient? Didn't you tell us we didn't need to do it? Here you are. <clears throat> David realizes that he is in a jam. It says he's terrified of Achish now, king of Gath, that he's going to get word that he's there. So he feigns madness. Now he's going to lose his self-respect. He's lost everything else. And he starts to act like an insane person. It says he starts to scratch on the doors. You know, th this is what you don't want to happen at your house in the middle of the night. You hear the scratching noise and you look and some guy's at your front door scratching on your door, letting s drools running out of his mouth on his beard. Uh, 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 uh. You know, that's all David can do. They grab him and they bring him to Achish. And Achish looks at David and he looks at his, his men. He said, are you guys out of your mind? I'm in government already. Do I need more mad men around me? What do you want me to do with this one? Take him home and let him live with me, he says. And they throw him out of Gath. <clears throat> Remarkably, God preserving his life. And David ends up in the cave. Alone. And God has systematically stripped away from him everything that the senses might take hold of to confirm God's involvement with one's life. <clears throat> every familiar face that David might see, every friend, every counselor, all of that has been stripped away from him. Every sense of security, every sound that would confirm to David that God is leading him, that he's in fact God's anointed king, it's all been stripped away. God has removed all of that from him so that David has to disallow all of his senses and all that's appealing to the natural in him that would contradict God's love and he has to somehow come to that place that he knew when he was a child in the fields writing psalms, looking to the living God, trusting him to kill a bear and a lion. David once again is stripped away of everything to where he'll look to heaven and this cave is where psalms begin to be written again and we're going to look at some of them this morning. And he's doing this without a psychologist, without a counselor, without a wellness center. They say that in America now annually, every year, there are 50 billion pills consumed in America that are either tranquilizers, sleeping pills, or painkillers. 50 billion, over 50 billion annually now in America. And David is alone. All of any kind of support is stripped away. And sometimes a prescription, sometimes 
a counselor is just what the great physician ordered. It is the proper thing. But there is a dullum. There is the place that God reserves the right to take all of us to and will where there's no way to look but up. There's no human being to look to. There's no strength that can be given on a natural plane. Just misery. And you know what? When I'm in that place, I want to be alone. I want to be miserable. When my wife is sick and tired and she doesn't want to be alone. She wants me to bring her ginger ale and tea and chicken soup and, you know. When I'm miserable, I want to be alone. I want to be extremely miserable. Nail my door shut, don't talk to me. Because I'm hardly ever miserable, so when I am, I want to do it right. And I want to get it all over with at once. I want to be intensely miserable. If you hear a sound coming out of the room, don't unlock the door. Don't come in. Some of you understand perfectly. And it says, David, as he's in the cave, 400 people come who are distressed, which simply means stressed out. They're in debt, which means they had probably become bond slaves to Saul because of heavy taxation. They're discontent, which means bitter of soul. Imagine that. When you want to be alone and you're in a cave, 400 miserable people come to be with you. (laughs) And then it says that his mom and his dad and his family comes. When I'm miserable, I don't want to be alone in a cave with 400 miserable people and my mom. I want to be alone. <clears throat> and yet, as I look at this, I think God is laying the foundation of the greatest government that Israel would ever see, right in this cave. The seedbed of it all is there. The greatest men and, and the greatest warriors, the greatest army that Israel will see, are there, grumbling and complaining. And David is learning the lessons in a dullum. And a dullum means resting place. That's not the kind of place I want to rest. I don't know about you guys. He's learning the lessons there that can never be learned in the palace. Yes, Saul has the palace and Saul has the army and Saul has the power and he has the money. But David has rediscovered the Lord. And David is listening to the voices of these 400 people. No doubt they're saying, man, if I get that Saul, I'm going to slit his throat. If I get behind him with a knife in a crowd, he's a dead man. And he's listening to all of this, no doubt. Everybody who had become a bond slave because of heavy taxation. Everybody was just so stressed out they couldn't stand it anymore. Those that were bitter of soul because of all of the changes in government that they had nothing to do with. It was infecting and affecting their lives. His own mom and dad and his brothers had to flee because no doubt Saul, if he got his hands on them, would have sent a messenger to David and said, if you want to see your family alive, you come back. They're hostage. And David is looking at all of that and he's learning. Don't overtax people. He's learning what government does to people to make them discontent and bitter of soul. And he slowly will take these discontented hearts and turn them around. We're going to look at that. And who better to lead than somebody who had been abused by government? Who better to lead than somebody who understands liberty? Somebody who understands the rights of the people under a government. They were all there. David has to listen to that. And I look at it and I think, Lord, what's our lesson in all of this? We know it's interesting. Psalm 34, Psalm 56, Psalm 57, and Psalm 142 were written from the cave. These are songs for cavemen and cave women. If you're a caveman today, cave woman, maybe you're married to a caveman. He likes to hit you on the head with a club and drag you home by your hair. 
If all's been stripped away, if you're in that place, there are songs written for that place that were born out of that place. I think the 142nd Psalm, and there's no chronology on them, to me is the first one written because it's the deepest as far as despair. If you'll turn to Psalm 142. It's the last of 14 psalms that say mescal, which means instruction. There are 14 psalms that are songs of instruction. This is the last one of those in the psalms. It says mescal of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. If you take note of the heading of some of these psalms. Important for us to see the, the musing and the searching of David's heart in this time because he survives. How do I survive my caves, Lord? Whether it's a cave of sickness or a a cave of despair, a cave of despondency and depression, Lord. A cave. How do I survive my adullams, Lord? How do I turn them from an empty rocky cave to a resting place? Let's look at him and see what he says here. His heart. Let's read through. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Now, by the way, Imagine David alone, if you've been to the Bell Caves in Israel, it's down in that area, and he can look two miles away and see the Valley of Elah where he killed the giant, and here he is alone in this cave, and you can imagine his voice echoing and ringing around as he's crying out, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, Then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they secretly laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, behold, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Look at the depth of it. Look at what he says here. Verse 2, he says, I poured out my complaint before the Lord. Verse 3, my spirit was overwhelmed within me. The, the word has the sense of being disoriented or being muffled. David said, the pressure was so great by the time I got to Adullam, I'm sitting there, I acted like an idiot in Gath, I'm dragging this big stupid sword that never did Goliath any good, my friends are gone, my family's gone, all seems lost, everything that would appeal to my natural thinking telling me that God has forsaken me, I'm overwhelmed, my spirit, and he doesn't say my soul, he doesn't say my mind, he's talking about the deepest part of his being, that no human being can talk him out of it. There isn't any emotional state that can lift him up. He's saying, my spirit, the deepest part of my being, he says, is overwhelmed within me. And yet you knew my path. I looked on my right hand, verse 4, behold, there was no man. He says, I'm forsaken. I'm alone. No man would know me. Refuge failed me. He's in one of those places, maybe you've been there, where there's not a single human being who's able to reach to us. And sometimes we're surrounded with them in a time like that. No man would know me. I was without refuge. Look in verse 6. Attend to my cry because I am brought very low. That's depression. And that gives the sense of it, putting a, a dent into something. I am brought very low. That's the point. Some people turn to suicide, to drugs. I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors. I am persecuted. Notice, they are stronger than I am. Lord, I am defeated. And remarkably in verse 7 he says, Bring 
my soul out of prison. Was he in a prison? David's soul was incarcerated by despair. David couldn't escape what was going on inside of him. The prison existed within his heart, within his mind, within his thinking, all the way down to his spirit, to the depth of his being. He said, Lord, bring me out of prison. Interesting. He ends by saying, but thou shalt deal bountifully with me. There's an upturn in this. What is the answer? Well, it's a song of instruction. Look in verse 1. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. He literally cried unto the Lord. With my voice unto the Lord, I made my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. This was not a 10-minute prayer. This may have gone on for days. I poured out my soul before the Lord. I showed or I opened up before the Lord. I cried unto thee, O Lord. You know, it's interesting because people come in sometimes for counseling. We say, well, are you reading the word? Are you seeking the Lord? I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) Always an easy answer. In a dullum, it's the only answer. God is building a king. He's building a king. And he's building many here. Because we, the distressed, the indebted, the discontents of this world, have attached ourselves to our king, who is anointed but not reigning, And have embraced him in his rejection. And will also stand with him in his glory. And he transcends every human problem. To where David in Adullam finally says, I cried unto thee, O Lord, verse 5, you are my refuge. Up the verse before that he said, there is no refuge, no man, verse 4, there is no refuge, he says. Refuge failed me. And in his crying to the Lord, he says, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. And he's come back to the place where he stood in the fields of Bethlehem. Once again, looking to the living God. Songs being written in the cave. Lord, you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. And I'm sure, <clears throat> as David began to sing these words, he would not have traded a dullum for the palace. He wouldn't have traded his 400 grumblers for the greatest army in the world. As he bowed the knee of his heart to God's sovereignty, And said, Lord, all of this is by your hand. I'm finding strength again. You're my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. You will deal bountifully with me. There's another one that says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, I am meek and lowly. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Psalm 56. Introduction says, David, when the Philistines took him in Gath, familiar words to you. Put them in their setting now. Understand where they're written from. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting daily, he's oppressing me. Verse 3 says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Verse 4, in God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Look down in verse 8. Lord, you tell all of my wanderings. You know all of my steps. 
Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not written in thy book? Familiar words to us. They are written in a dullum. They are written in the reality of pain and despair and loneliness. And David looks to the living God and says, Lord, you know every one of my tears individually. You haven't left off from me. You're as intimately involved with my life as you have ever been. And every single tear is recorded, Lord. You know all of my wanderings. You know all of my steps. I won't fear what man can do unto me. In thee will I sing. I'll praise your name. Look to Psalm 57. Familiar to us. Remember it's from Adullam. Verse 5 says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. We sing these words. Let thy glory be above all of the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory. Awake psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. I would like to have heard this bouncing around the inside of that cave. Psalm 34. Just so when you read through these, these are songs for cavemen. When you're bottomed out, go to these songs. Remember the context they were written in. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We've sung that. My soul shall make her boast in thee, O Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Look down in verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. Written from Adullam. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, that's why everything else had been stripped away. So he could say those words again. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Speaking to his distressed army. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no one in them that fear him. Speaking to the debtors that are in the cave with him. The young lions do lack. They suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Speaking to the bitter of soul, the discontent. Come ye children. Imagine David. Four hours of sword practice, two hours of bow and arrow practice, and five hours of Bible study in the cave. Listen to him talking to these 400. By chapter 23, there's 600 men that have surrounded him. Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life, that loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil. Man, is that what I want to do when some Saul has hassled me, when I've been driven to despair? That's why David's government and his army would experience the greatness that it would because they learned these lessons in Adullam. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Imagine a cabinet and a senate and a congress that this is their theme song and this is the truth that they walk in. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all of their troubles. What a great beginning. What a terrible place. What a tomb of despair. What a prison house he's in on one side. And in the physical as he looks around at all of the things that are breaking his heart. And yet on the other side what starts to be born out of that. As David again looks to the living God. As David remembers as all of these things begin to flood back, as he cries out in his despair and his distress, saying that his soul is overwhelmed, but he says, in that I cried to the Lord. That's the point of the whole thing. I poured out my soul before him, and the Lord heard me. I began to get up early, Lord. I realized that all of my wanderings, you know them all. Every one of my tears, Lord, are not lost. I'm not sobbing alone, broken, forsaken. You know every tear that I shed. Oh Lord, I'm going to get up early with my harp. I'm going to sing your praises. Be thou exalted, O Lord. 
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Mercies endure forever. Oh, ye children of men, would you learn of the Lord? Do you desire long life and good days? Keep your tongue from evil. Don't give yourself to revenge. Trust in him. Know that he leads. His ears are open to the righteous. That he knows the way of the wicked and he'll remove the remembrance of them. Songs for cavemen. Adullam. A prison house or the place of rest. Depending on what grid we put it through. I encourage you today. I'm going to have the musicians come.